Open your copy of the Word of God today to the book of Judges, where we are going to begin a new series of messages today that I'm calling Judge for Yourself. The book of Judges, an amazing portion of the Word of God. I want to begin message number one today by talking to you, challenging you, begging you, imploring you to break the cycle. Break the cycle in your life. What is a cycle? I looked to Mr. Webster, he gave me a definition. He says that a cycle is defined as a series of events that are regularly repeated in the same order. Now, there are many examples of cycles in our world. Take as an example, we begin the year with the spring. The spring is so mild. You get that nice breeze. Things are in bloom. And then soon that nice breeze gives way to a hot summer. And the humidity here in East Tennessee, sometimes it just makes us sweat by walking outside and just standing still. Sometimes still I can sweat in the hot summer heat and the humidity of East Tennessee. But then not long after that, we have the fall to look forward to. We know that's when football starts back and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. This is dead season for me in sports. I am suffering right now when it comes to sports. I am waiting for the fall to come, the nice, cool, crisp breeze in the fall, the leaves, how they begin to change. This is God's country in East Tennessee when the fall arrives. And then not long after that, the fall gives way to the winter, the hard, cold, long, sometimes snowy winter. And then you know as well as I do that when the winter has finally concluded, that the cycle starts all over again. Spring, summer, fall, winter, no matter what we want to do, no matter how we want to rearrange our calendar, we cannot break the season cycle. Now I want you to think about us as human beings. Did you know that it's possible for us as individuals to get involved in all sorts of cycles? Some of them are good cycles, and some of them are bad cycles. Take as an example somebody who's in a good cycle, a man or a woman who has as their practice to get up early in the morning, to spend some time with the Lord in prayer, maybe to go to the gym or to the neighborhood, to the streets, to exercise themselves physically after they've exercised themselves spiritually. And then they go out to their workplace. They do their job with integrity. They work hard. They earn a good, honest wage that then they come in the evenings and they bring home to their wife and to their children or to their spouse, whatever the case might be. And then they spend that time trying to be a godly spouse, trying to be a godly parent, trying to be a Christ-honoring follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then go to bed in peace every night, knowing that you've lived for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then get up the next day and do it all over again. That's a good cycle. My concern today, though, is that there are some in this room under the sound of my voice, and you are either in a bad cycle right now or you have escaped a bad cycle, but you are feeling the pull and the draw of Satan to come back. Did you know, church, that you can watch a family and look back generation after generation after generation and see wickedness and corruption and unholiness and ungodliness passing from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next? The good news is today, though, you can break the cycle. You can be free. We just sang a few minutes ago that our God is a chain breaker, and today, through His power, you can break whatever cycle of wickedness there is in your life. And let's be honest about it today. Some of the cycle that some of us are in it may not be anything necessary that we caused. It might be something that we inherited. And sometimes people might look at you and say, well, he'll never be any better than that, or she'll never be any better than that. That's just who they are. That's what their family is. 
That is the voice of the devil who wants you to stay bound in your chains and your oppression and your wickedness. But the Lord Jesus Christ says where the Son has come, He sets people free. And when the Son has set people free, they shall be free indeed. The chains are gone. It's broken. Today I want us to look at a cycle that a nation was involved in. Nation of Israel, bad cycle that they got caught up in. We're looking at chapters 1 and 2 today. I do not have the time this morning to read all of the wonderful, precious, and errant Word of God that we find there in those two chapters. It would take you probably 5 to 10 minutes, depending on how fast you read, to look over that material. I encourage you, go home, read all of the material, and see the cycle that Israel gets caught in. I want to try and bring out some of the high points today. Step number one in the cycle I'm identifying for us this morning is a strong foundation according to chapter 1 and then again in chapter 2. The Bible says there that Judah went up and the Lord delivered. Now let me give you some context for where we are today. Very briefly, there was a man named Abraham. God made a promise to Abraham. He said, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the heaven and the sand on the seashore. And for several generations after that, Abraham's family prospered and did well. And Joseph becomes the right-hand man to Pharaoh in the ancient kingdom of Egypt. But the Bible says in Exodus chapter 1, there arose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph, nor did he care. And so what did they do? They took the Israelites into captivity. And the Bible says in the New Testament, for 400 years they oppressed and enslaved the Israelites. Some estimates say that during that period of time, we know the Bible says that Israel continued uh, continued to be blessed under the hand of Pharaoh and Egypt. Some estimates say there might have been 3 million Israelites at the end of that 400 year period. God hears the oppression of His people. And what does He do? He raises up a man. And that man is named Moses. Moses goes to the most powerful man in the ancient world by the command and the voice of God and says, Let my people go. The Bible says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened against the request and against God and against God's people, Israel. He would not let them go until finally... You remember ten plagues came. And on that tenth plague, the firstborn of all of the male children in Egypt were gone. Slaughtered. And then Pharaoh says, get these people out of my face. And so they begin to make their way out of their captivity from Egypt. They come to a Red Sea. There's water in front of them. There's no way they're going to be able to get across. And the bad news is Pharaoh's had a change of heart. Now the Egyptians are coming hard and fast and chasing them to the Red Sea. Israel has the water in front of them and they have the greatest army in the ancient world behind them. What in the world are they going to do? Have you ever had a situation like that in your life? when you were hemmed in on every side and you didn't feel like you knew that you were going to do anything that you were going to be able to do, that's exactly the kind of situation where God loves to step in and intervene and show His power and show His glory. And when they called upon the name of God at the command of Moses, the waters parted to the left and to the right. And the Bible says that millions of Israelites crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. And when every last one of the Israelites had crossed, the water came crashing down and the Egyptian army was washed up in the Red Sea. Through Moses they begin to make their way towards the promised land, but they have a problem. The problem is that they refuse to believe God and they refuse to honor God's man and so they begin to complain about their leadership. And so the Bible says, for 40 years, what should have been a very short journey turns into 40 years of wandering around in the wilderness until every unbelieving man is dead. And then when that 40 years is done, God one more time raises up a man named Joshua. 
He says, Joshua, you're going to take my people into the land that I promised them years ago. And because Joshua is a man of God and because the people are willing to believe God, the Bible says they make their way across the Jordan. They come into the promised land, the land that Israel occupies still today as evidence of the presence of God in this world, Him bringing His people back into their land. For the first time they come in to take conquest of the promised land. And in many ways they do well. They flourish in the land. Before Joshua dies, he says this, Joshua 24, verse 15, you're going to have to choose for yourselves this day whom you're going to serve. The gods of the, the Perizzites or the god of the Canaanites or the god of the Hivites, listen, you can serve any of them that you want, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And leaving them with that challenge, Joshua dies and passes off the scene and leaves Israel in the hands of the twelve tribes that come and inherit the land. When we come to the book of Judges, that's where we find things that brings us to step number one in our cycle. Israel started out with a strong foundation in the promised land. Several of the tribes begin to go to war. Judah, Simeon, Joseph. Several of the tribes begin to go to war. They begin to do what God asked them to do. And as a result of their obedience, the Bible says that God the Lord delivered them. Now, think with me about this as we're talking about cycles this morning. Most people that are caught up in a bad cycle right now probably got off to a good start somewhere along the way. That family that is known for their wickedness, that is known for their poverty, that is known for their illiteracy, somewhere along the way, they probably had a good foundation. But slowly over time, they begin to depart from that foundation. I've got a confession to make. The pastor doesn't watch too much TV. But I do have one show I like to watch. My kids will tell you this. When it comes on, do any of y'all know who Dr. Nalzardin is? Y'all know what show I'm talking about? Have y'all ever seen 600 pound life before? I mean, when it comes on, I am fascinated by these people who have ate themselves into a prison that normally is their own bed. And you look at their lives and you say, how could it ever become like this? You know, they go back and they look at the childhood stories of most of the people that they document on the show. And most of them had a pretty good foundation. Now, not in all ways. There's some trauma later on in their life. But early on, it seemed like they were doing well. They were healthy. They were slender. There was no problem. And then normally some trauma comes up in their life. And instead of processing their pain in a good, healthy way, they begin to eat themselves into a coffin. I'm just saying, some people, many people, most people that are got caught up in a bad cycle probably had a good start somewhere along the way. What about the United States of America? I don't care what any redactionary historian says about the foundation of this country. This country was founded a Christian nation honoring the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you do not believe me, go to New England. Go to New England and look for yourself at the center of every old town, centuries old. You will find a church... Because the ancients believed in order for this society to work, it must be grounded on Almighty God and on His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. They were not mosque, church, put here in this country to begin with. There were not Hindu temples placed here. There were not Buddhist shrines placed here. There were churches erected for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. This country got the foundation it needed to begin with. Founded on the Lord Jesus Christ. Most cycles, church, begin with a solid foundation. Number two. Step two in the cycle. The favor of God. 
the favor of God. We see from verses 19 through 26, the Bible says that the Lord was with them. The Lord was with Judah. There is a clear pattern in the Scripture. Human obedience is always met with the favor of God. Now, of course, that's not always to say that obeying God is going to make all of your dreams come true. In fact, oftentimes, if you've been totally obedient to God, you will find yourself in some of the hardest circumstances of your life. The example that comes to my mind, the one that our musicians kind of made reference to in the song this morning, Paul and Silas are serving God. They free a young girl of a demonic spirit. And what happens to them? Doing the will of God, they find themselves locked up in a prison. Don't think that just because some trials and adversities come to your life, it is the judgment of God upon you. It could be. But sometimes obedience to God will find you in some very difficult places. But even in the adversity of life, if I've been obedient to God, His favor rests on me. Paul and Silas were locked up in a jail. What they start doing at midnight, the Bible says, they started singing praise and hymns to the Most High God. And in just a matter of time, prison doors flew open. Walls came come tumbling down. Chains fell off because the favor of God was on their ministry. Because they'd been obedient to God. We just see here from Israel that God blesses them as a result of their being obedient or being obedient, rather, to God. Now, for a moment, think about your own life. Look at your own life. Do you remember on those occasions where you honored God? You can look back and see that you experienced the peace of God in your life. Can't you look back and see how God intervened? The Bible says in... Proverbs, or rather Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He'll grant you the desires of your heart. And many of us can look back and say, even in those times that we've been obedient to God, that God surely has done that. When you see a family that is committed to honoring God, you see the blessing of God on their life. When you see an individual who is ready to break the cycle and make all things right, you see the favor of God on their life. When you see a country like the United States of America from its foundation that was willing to bless the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, don't take it from me, take it from the Scripture. Psalm 33, verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. If you want to know why America has been so blessed throughout the centuries, it's because this was a nation where God was the Lord of this people. Now, I know we've departed from that. That's part of the cycle that we're in right now. Number three, you have the favor of God, but then you see number three, wickedness begins to creep in. According to the end of chapter one, the beginning of chapter two, despite all the good that was done by the tribes of Judah and Simeon and Joseph and the others, there was still some unfinished business. Rather than driving them out, They took their money instead. You know what that tells me? That means that they sold out. That gold became their God. Have you ever known a person that's done that before? Money became the most important thing in their life. Stuff became the most important thing in their life. A foothold can become a stronghold if it's left unchecked. If you give your adversary, the devil, a foothold, it will become a stronghold very soon. How does this work? It's the family that stopped going to church because they decided they would rather sleep in on Sunday morning. It is the glutton who stopped getting on the scales instead to go to the buffet and belly up. It is the nation that begins to believe that they are self-made. That it's through our genius we've arrived at where we are today and it really had nothing to do with God. 
You allow that to go on a little while in your life, and when that wickedness creeps in, after a while, it finally takes over. It happens in individuals. It happens in families. And it happens for entire nations. And then how does God respond to our laziness and our wickedness? Step number four. The judgment of God. The judgment of God, according to chapter 2. What does God say? God says, I will not drive them out before you. I told you I would. I said that if you would obey me, I would drive out your enemies. But now, because you have refused me, I will not drive them out before you. You know, one one of the wonderful things about the God that we serve is that He is a God who punishes those that belong to Him. Now, the author of Hebrews said, Hebrews chapter 12, no punishment seems good at the time. But after that punishment has worked out God's plan for that punishment in our lives, then it brings the peaceable fruit of righteousness for those who've been trained by the chastisement of God. Verse 15 says that the hand of the Lord was against His own people Israel. Did you hear that? that God raised up His own hand against His own people. Why would God do that to His people Israel? Is it because He hated them? No church. It was because He loved them. But God loves you enough to punish you and to correct you. Listen, if you choose to live in wickedness, do not be surprised when the hand of God's judgment finds its way to your life. Moses said to the children of Israel, being sure of this very thing, that your sins will find you out. The Bible says in Hebrews, all those that the Lord loves, He chastens. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 34, verse 7, by no means shall God allow the guilty to go unpunished. We just sang about it this morning when we sang amen. We magnified the holiness of God. We magnified the righteousness of God. And if He is a holy God, He will not coexist with sin. And if you belong to Him, He'll do everything to purge sin from your life. Because He wants you to be holy just like He's holy. Let me ask you something, church. Can judgment come to a family? Now, I'm not talking about things like generational curses. I'm not trying to be too mystical. I'm just asking you, can the judgment of God come to a family? I want to answer that question unequivocally, yes. I have seen it over and over again. Families that are trapped in a cycle of wickedness and of holiness and poverty and illiteracy because they will not honor God. They're caught in a cycle. Can the judgment of God come to an individual? Well, ask David. Ask even great men who are willing to sin against God. You can get caught in a cycle through your own wickedness. Can the judgment of God come to a nation? The answer to that question is yes. You say, Pastor, you don't sound very patriotic. Do you love America? The answer to that question is yes, I do love America with all of my heart. I've been to Israel. I've been to England. I've been to Canada. Just came back from the Caribbean. And I'm telling you, there's no other place in the world that I'd want to be than the United States of America. I love this country. I love my nation. But I'm telling you, if God did not withhold punishment from His own people Israel, what makes you think that America will escape the judgment of God? He is a merciful God. But His mercy will not last forever. When we call abomination a choice... God will not be merciful to us forever. Step number five. What happens? 
Well, what happened for Israel? Step number five, they started crying out for help. Chapter 2, verse 18, the Bible says that it was because of their groaning, because of those who oppressed them. They began to groan, they began to cry out to God. When judgment came to Israel, they could do nothing else but cry out for the mercy of God. So verse 18 says they were groaning because of those who oppressed them. The same mouths that Israel had used to plot wickedness against God and to forge treaties that they should not have forged are now the same mouths that are crying out for the mercy of God. Now can you imagine that? Did Israel deserve the mercy of God? Church, the answer to that question is no. Israel did not deserve God's mercy. But I want to fill you in on something today. The reason it's called mercy is because it cannot be deserved. And because it is not earned. If you have sinned against God, this morning I might be preaching and you might be convicted of your sins and Satan may have told you, you cannot cry out to God because God will not hear you. He cannot forgive you. What you've done is too great and God is not listening to you anymore. That is the voice of the devil. In the midst of your greatest wickedness, you can turn your head to heaven and you can cry out and you can ask forgiveness from the Most High God. And the Bible says, a contrite and a broken spirit, he will by no means turn away. Anytime is the right time to call upon the name of the God who loves you and saved you. You know, it's a shame though. We talk about crying out to God. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever said, God, if you'll just deliver me from this, I promise I'll do. God, if you'll just save me from this trouble that I'm going through right now, Lord, if you'll just deliver me right now, I promise you I will. Have you ever said that to God before? Have you ever said that and made a promise to God and then not kept that promise? The psalmist David says, Lord, I will deliver what I have vowed. If you've consecrated some part of your life to God, then you need to give it to Him. I'm just trying to say sometimes we wait until we get in trouble before we start calling upon the Lord. Are you listening to me today? Sometimes we wait until we are in trouble before we cry out upon the Lord. Don't you think that we would be spared a lot of trouble if we cried out to Him before we were in trouble? Israel doesn't deserve the mercy of God, but they're crying out for help. Step six, the mercy of God. The mercy of God. What does the Bible say here that God does? The Bible says that the Lord raised up judges who delivered them. If you want to know where this book of the Bible got its name from, it's from this passage here. It's judges that God raises up to deliver His people Israel. Over and over again, as we're going to find when we study through this book, Israel sins against God. They go back, they revert back to wickedness. And time and time again, God raises up judges because of His mercy who deliver them from all manner of enemies around them. Have you ever cried out to God because you were in a bad, busted, broken system? Have you ever cried out to God and God stepped up and intervened in your life? He saved that family from despair. Everything that they had was about to be taken away and God delivered them from that. That individual who is at the point of death because they were suffering the judgment of God, that individual cries out to God and God raises them up off a sick bed. That nation that is wicked and wayward and yet they cry out upon the Lord. You say, Pastor, I'd like to think that there's still hope for the United States of America but we're pretty wicked. Let me tell you something. There was a group of people in a town called Nineveh, and the Bible says that in Nineveh, there was 120,000 people. That would be the equivalent of New York City in our modern day world. 
It was a major metropolis in the ancient world. 120,000 people and the Lord God Himself says they are so wicked they don't know their right hand from their left. And yet when the prophet of God walks into town and says 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown, when they repent and get right with God, guess what God did? These were wicked, vile people that God was going to use to bring judgment to Israel. And when these wicked people called upon the name of God, guess what God did? God gave them His mercy. There is no nation, there is no family, there is no person that is too far gone that you cannot receive the mercy of God. If you'll cry out for the Lord Jesus Christ. If he can take a murderer like Paul and turn him to the greatest missionary the world has ever seen, there is still hope for you. And there is hope for me. Step seven. Here's where the cycle gets problematic for us. Reverting back to wickedness. God brings these judges to Israel and the Bible says that they would not listen, that they reverted back to their wickedness. Have we ever seen anything like this in our families or in our individual lives in the United States of America? One of the greatest examples I think that I can remember in my own life, I'm sure there's many others well beyond 1977 when I was born, do you remember when 9-11 happened? Watching those horrible images of those jets flying into the Twin Towers. I was a student at Southeastern Seminary. I was finishing up my master's degree. I was in chapel. And the dean of faculty, who's now gone on to be with the Lord, Russ Bush... He walked in, he said, students, I'm sorry to tell you, but there's been a tragedy in New York City. And you need to go home and be with your wives and your children. I went to the student center because I don't think any of us really knew what had happened at that point. And I saw one of the twin towers on fire. And as I was standing there watching the coverage of that twin tower burning, a second jet flew into the other one. And you know as well as I do, within an hour, both of those towers came crashing down. The greatest terrorist act on the soil of the United States of America. When all those thousands of people lost their lives in New York City in the Twin Towers. Do you remember, church, what happened in our churches after that? We saw people coming to Christ. We saw pews being filled that had not been filled before. We saw seats being filled that had not been filled before. For a great period of time, we saw a revival in our churches after the wake-up call that was sent to our nation on 9-11. People started getting right with God. And then, in the process of time, we revert back to our old wickedness. Some of the things that have happened in the last 10 or 15 years are some of the greatest wickedness that's ever happened in the United States of America. Reverting back to our old wickedness. You as an individual, your family, God has delivered you, God has blessed you, God has given you His mercy, and how have you repaid Him? By slipping back into some old habits and to some old wickedness. One more step. I want you to pay close, close attention to this last step. Number eight. The observation of God. The observation of God. You know what God says? Listen to me when I tell you this. A man of God told me this. I heard him preach this. 
O.S. Hawkins, the director of our Southern Baptist Convention, the old annuity board, now Guidestone Financial Resources. He was in our chapel one day and I heard him say this and I don't think I understood it at the time, but I believe I understand it now. The fear of God is not so much that God would put His hand on me, but it's rather that God would remove His hand from me. Let me tell you what God did for Israel. God intervened. He put His hand on them. He judged them. And when they cried out, He sent them judges and delivered them from their wickedness. And then what did they do? They reverted back to their wickedness. So this God who put His hand on His people, guess what He did? He took it right off. And He let the adversaries of Israel come right into them. The Bible says there at the end of chapter 2 that He might test them. This is how I want to conclude this message today. Some of you are involved in a bad cycle right now. Addiction, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, pornography, Gambling, it could be any number of things, lying, cheating, stealing. You're involved in a bad cycle right now. Some of your families have been in a cycle of wickedness for generations. And now the wickedness has poured down to you. And a choice has got to be made. Do you know what I think God sent me here to say to you today? God took His hand off His own people Israel that He might test them. What I'm saying to you today is that the cycle that has come down to your life, whether you chose it or whether it chose you, that cycle that's coming down to your life, God is watching your life to see if you will let the cycle continue or if you will break the cycle in your life. Now, I don't mean to tell you today that you can do it by yourself because you can't. But if you will call upon the name of the Lord, confess the wickedness of your family. Confess the generations of sin that have come before you. Confess the abuse. Confess the neglect. Confess all the wickedness. Say, Lord, I know it was ungodly. I know my family hasn't pleased you. I know I haven't served you in my life. But Father God, I am ready to repent. And I am ready to be right with you. And I promise if you'll give your life wholly and completely to the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter how long, no matter how thick, no matter how old that chain might be in your life, that chain can come breaking off and crashing down. But it is up to you. It is up to you. Dale and our choir led us a few minutes ago in Chain Breaker. You know, the sad thing for me, I can see it. I can see it on the faces of the people that God has blessed me to have as sheep in this congregation. We sing about the chain breaker. Yet sometimes, though, when you walk out of the building, you take those chains right back out of here with you. God's saying to you today, brother, sister, child, isn't it time to take the chains off? Isn't it time to break the cycle? Satan says you can't. God says you can. Would you bow your head with me, please? Father God, I've done my very best today to use the example of Israel to show your people here at Black Oak Heights Baptist Church, that, Father God, there are wicked, ungodly, unholy cycles. But, Father God, if we'll get right with you, you can break every chain. And him who the Son has set free, he shall be free indeed. Lord, 
I believe today that there are some people who walked into this sanctuary at Black Oak Heights Baptist Church and Father God, they have the weight of bondage, of burdens, of their past. Lord, there are some people in this room under the sound of my voice, they were abused as children, they were neglected, they were mistreated, they were yelled at, and Father God, Satan has used that to be a burden and a binding to them to this very day. And Lord, now it is time for the cycle to stop. To stop with us and to start a new cycle of godliness and holiness and love and warmth and kindness. It takes one man, one woman, who'd be willing to give everything to the Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of the song we say, I hear those chains falling. I hear the chains falling. Father God, my prayer during the invitation is that I would hear chains falling at Black Oak Heights Baptist Church. The cycles are broken. Father, we commit this to you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.